Hey everyone, this is Mike, and it is Wednesday, March 25th, 2020. And uh, I want to go over a couple things because, you know, <laughs> surprise, it's gotten weird. It's gotten really friggin' weird. And so um, uh, a line has, has been drawn in the sand in terms of like, um, inner world reality, outer world reality, and where they meet. Like, that's always been part of the human experience about, like, you know, everyone's got an inner world. Every, every person who's been a person, you know, they've got an entire subjective experience, and then they are faced with an external experience, whatever that may be, and then those two are going to meet. And, like, that's how each thing is, is unique. That's just, you know, that's just... A, a fact of how experience is and um, that is recognized by uh, you know a percentage of people and they can live their life that way but um, one of the the reasons why it would be appealing to so few people is because it's a lot of life living on faith you know you're, you're going by on some stuff which uh, uh, I didn't even realize I could do that. Okay. Um, you know, you're going, you're going through experience, um, you're going through experience in life, uh, unaware of, um, the relationship between the inner world and the outer world and, and not really seeing, um, and not seeing it. And then you could see it. And then there's certain ways of interacting with it. But again, like a lot of this is the internal world subjective sort of stuff. And depending upon the, the, um, culture, which you're living in, um, you're either going to, uh, uh, that's going to be encouraged or not encouraged. And it's primarily not encouraged in modern culture to live life that way. And, um, but there's a big push. Um, there's a big push towards it being easier uh, to live life that way. Um, number one is, is like, <laughs> uh, you know, no matter how you want to look at it, we are collectively in a position where everyone is in like a new area and things are changing rapidly. And that's true on every level, but, but it's undeniably true on the experiential level. Um, and, you know, because of that, because we're going into this, this unknown territory, the natural, um, the natural inclination for preparation, you know, the human mind's like, I want to prepare for, you know, the worst case scenario. Um, all of that is kind of like, things are fluid now. You know, that's what you would say. Things are fluid now. And all of the training, like everything you've done in life, if you could see that as training, has prepared for you, has prepared you for this exact moment. Because how do you know it's this moment? Because everyone's experiencing it at the same time. And everyone, no matter where it's meeting them, you know, they're going to be faced with, um, they're going <laughs> to, you know, it's going to meet, it's going to meet each person uniquely. And how are you meeting it? Is you look around, but you know, everyone's meeting it very, very real right now. So <clears throat> if you want to navigate that, like there's this, there's a natural human tendency to want to have some sort of control of your destiny. Um, and part of this dance is recognizing like, let, how much do you let go and like trust? And then how much do you like control? Because, you know, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of fearful things about trusting. Um, and so this is like, you know, this is big boy conversation. This is where like the world of conspiracy overlaps with the world of experience and spiritual and all that sort of stuff. So the truth of the matter is the human experience is, is we're built with this thing which we're calling like a subconscious. Um, and what we're being told, uh, and my experience has shown it to be very accurate, um, like the majority of our aware behavior, you know, why we do things, why we think a certain way, why we do anything is really predicated on something which we're completely unaware of. 
So whether that being like, you know, it all comes from childhood. And if you really sit down and think, you're like, well, what experience would, would happen in childhood, which would show itself like this uh, in my adulthood? Like, you know, there's a blind spot there and you can't see everything. And at the same time, we also recognize um, that's an entire um, very, very rich um, playing field of life in this kind of like mystic unknown. And there are people that have taken advantage of that. And that is the danger. And that, that's happened in history. You know, that's what we're experiencing very much um, uh, collectively. I don't know how far it goes back. But what probably makes the most amount of sense is this is what would be known as Pisces age type of, um, of, of experience, you know, whether or not, you know, how far back the, the ages, the procession of the equinox goes, goes back far enough, you know, the stars themselves are, are deeper, but the story, which we, this narrative of human experience is very much, um, uh, seen through this, this, this the zodiacal narrative, you know, we see that in many cultures. So it's like going back to that level of reality where that narrative happens. Um, Pisces has a lot to do with like this mystic and not really being able to see completely in the mist, like imagine a very, very deep misty area. Uh, and part of you is like, wow, this is very like interesting and magical. If you've ever found yourself like in this real in really thick mist and like kind of like really anywhere, but particularly like a wooded area, like it feels very, very different and, and it feels different and it is different. Um, and if you could imagine that like an energy or a quality, it's like that is very Pisces and that inherently has a certain amount of risk. There's a certain amount of trust, which is needed. There's a certain amount of risk and in practical reality, that certain amount of risk is like, um, there are organizations and there are people and like you could go as deep as you want, which take advantage of those, um, of those inherent blind spots or risks, which are just part of the human experience, part of having a subconscious. There's going to be all sorts of stuff that you don't know, which is like way back there that if you're so focused on like kind of what you're doing and living your life, you don't even, you, you're coming up with good reasons why you're doing something, but you're doing all this stuff, which you don't quite understand. And, um, surrendering to that has, it has risks. Like literally imagine like, you know, this, the whole Luke Skywalker thing. If you could go back to like the first star Wars movie that came out in 1977, and like you got uh, Luke and he's like in the Millennium Falcon and he's like getting trained. He's getting like an entire like lifetime of training on the amount of time it takes them to go from like wherever they were with Obi-Wan to, to the, the Death Star where they're gonna wor worship the, or worship. They were gonna go and uh, rescue the princess. And they're going into the most dangerous area in the heart of it. And they're taking like, you know, the most fortified thing. Like that's the, that's the idea of Star Wars, what's happening. And like, you know, anyone who, um, who, who deeply resonated with it, you're meant to resonate through the, the loop perspective. So it's going to wake up that, that quality within each individual. And, you know, some people, they're going to resonate with it more than others, but it was done on such a deep level. It's resonating. So it's like, you're going back to the Luke thing. Uh, you're, you're playing Luke and there's a scene as they're going from uh, towards the most dangerous area and Luke is trying to get like an entire lifetime of training um, because he's just found out that, yeah, your entire life has prepared you for this moment. And they're like, put on the helmet and use the force to like use the, the with this, with the lightsaber to, to like deflect the shots of this, this uh, um, practice, um, uh, uh, sparring partner. And, um, at first Luke is trying to like think too much, like, where's it going to go? Where's it go? And he's like getting hit, but he's kind of good at it because he's blocking some of the shots. And then like, you know, uh, Obi-Wan tells him, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, use the force, trust the force. And like Luke goes and he centers and he goes, trust the force. And he like blocks the whole thing. Um, but we're kind of at that period right now. And that period has always been like, you know, if you had, um, if you have a degree of self-awareness, you recognize that. So you kind of like, whether you're conscious of this or not, 
or not, you are um, resistant to like fully, fully surrendering to the, okay, I'm going to trust it all. Um, and there's a, there's a natural like self-protection and health, which is part of that because this is kind of like, you know, quote unquote, you're going into the unknown, but there comes a point where you have to go and like, all right, you're going into the unknown and you're going to have to use trust and intuition and like all of this kind of stuff, which, you know, you don't really prepare for, but you prepare for like, no matter what you've done, like what you're being asked to do right now is always like, you know, it's exceeding your mental grasp, but that's where everyone's finding themselves right now. And so because we're all finding ourselves right now in this place that, um, and it's meeting everyone where they are. Um, we need to, um, you know, recognize the situation, the, the territory, the way it is, you know, um, almost like, um, you were dropped behind, uh, uh, you were trained for this. You were, you were, um, you, <laughs> you were Jason Bourne. You were Luke Skywalker. You were every, every character you've ever seen that, um, finds themselves, you were Batman that finds themselves that, uh, are in a place that they never quite thought they would be in, but now they're there. And they're like, all right, game on. And that's true for all of us. And that's like kind of the higher truth of, of, the, uh, um, of the culture which we found ourselves in. Because you have to remember that, yes, we are living in an inversion culture, an inversion world where everything is turned upside down. But there's a truth also that the inversion world has no creative energy. You know, it's just like kind of like destructive energy. And what it can do is it can copy and it can inverse because that's what an inversion does in, in mathematics, the purest, most abstract way. Like, you know, you take a, a seven, that's seven over one, and then you invert that one over seven. You know, that's the inversion of it. And you multiply those together, it collapses on itself. It just becomes this one thing, you know, it becomes one. And that's what, what, um, what is happening on a higher perspective. You know, you can go and look at it that way. And, you know, I guess what, what, what the, the freedom of, of, of choice or of will of whatever this experience is, is like, you know, accepting your place and how you're, you know, how you're playing it. You know, do you accept your, your, this part of the curve? Are you accepting your, the curve? Are you the wave? Are you the meeting point? Are you all of these? Like, you know, it's like, whatever it is, is what you've chosen to experience it as. <laughs> but once you get a level of awareness, it's just awareness, you know, and it's like, then the fun of playing the game is this is how I'm, 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 um, I'm experiencing it. So that's what's happening right now. And that's like a, um, if you're trying to hold on too tight, you're going to snap. This is designed for that. That's designed for like, um, this is too much pressure. Like this is, this is the perfect, um, this is the perfect storm, if you will. This was, this was, uh, <laughs> you know, if everything is to line up, because that's what we're seeing is we're seeing a lining up of what of everything, what's everything, well, everything you can imagine, you know, that's lining up and it's coming together in this way. And it's like, this is it. And whatever you've done, which is prepared, for, which you've prepared for or not have prepared for has brought you to this moment. That's what your training is for. And now you're waking up behind enemy lines and like, this is it. And what do you got? You got the stuff around you. And what do you know? You just got to know what you know. <laughs> and that's where we're finding ourselves. And there's an excitement with that. And there's a new way of being, and there's like a sorrow with this, and there's all sorts of stuff. And that's all part of what's going on right now. And that's in your world, and that's in, in, in the outer world. And so we're seeing this thing, you know, you're, you're, if you're watching this, I'm hoping that you have some degree of awareness of what's happening. 
and you have some degree of acceptance of your own blind spot of like, you know, I'm, I don't want to fully accept this, but I don't want to fully discount it. But like, where am I going? And like, you know, that's where like the material senses are really good. Like, you know, uh, the material senses are going to come, are going to bring you to a certain line. And some people stay on that line their entire lives. And then, you know, at some point, if you're going to go further, you're going to have to cross over. And you're going to have to start trusting on, on your, your physical material senses with something a little bit greater. And then as you become more and more comfortable, you know, you, you're able to work with that with greater and greater, um, with greater and greater uh, um, skill and magist, magistry, I'm trying to say majestic, <laughs> like with, with majesticness quality. And what I'm imagining when I'm saying that is like, if you've ever seen like rhythmic gymnastics, that's what it's called. And it's like, you know, it's really popular in Russia and like the Eastern Bloc. And it would be like, if you're familiar with like the floor exercise of, of gymnastics. And that's been like sewn into our collective culture, like really, really strong in 1976. Like that was the year of uh, uh, Nadia Comaneci. She was the, uh, she won the, she had the first perfect 10 in the Olympics, in the Summer Olympics. And she was this little like 16 year old Romanian girl. And, you know, she was able to do things with grace and beauty. That's what gymnastics is so spectacular about. My nice skating, skiing, and like all surfing, and like all these things that require like this amazing blend between, um, between like, uh, like physicality and like, you know, total control and then total like, release and and um trusting into like this thing that i'm letting go and like and then having a really good control over once they're letting go so rhythm rhythm rhythmic gymnastics so it's the floor exercise so imagine the floor exercise and doing like those runs and those flips and all those things which like you know mary lou retton did and like you know uh uh you know always the 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 winner the gold medalist of the all-around uh female um women's gymnastics like the floor exercise is huge it's huge in our collective consciousness and so that's only half the story rhythmic gymnastics tells the other story and so that's where we're at we're at rhythmic gymnastics so let me tell you what it is so you've got the floor you've got the floor exercise you can see like you know that immense like speed and running and flipping and landing like not only the ability to do that but to do that with the entire world watching like think about that and you start to think about like how did they do that how do you go from just being a normal walking person to doing that well you do it by little baby steps you know that's like the more resolution you bring to anything now, this is what gymnastics this is what martial arts um particularly uh teaches us that when we bring resolution, you know, really, really fine awareness or, or, or to the, the small details, particularly the transitions when you move from one state to another and you own those small, tiny little steps, well, then the big picture of running really fast and doing three triple jumps is because it's built up from all of these smaller things. So that's the floor exercise. It's amazing. It's like, wow, they do all of that. Well, what rhythmic gymnastics is, so imagine doing all of that, all of that is there, like, you know, the, the, the skill and the athleticism and the, and the dance and the beauty and the pressure and like all of that stuff. And you have in your hand, like maybe about the size of a grapefruit. Um, and it's this like, uh, it's a ball. It's, it's, it's um, smooth, but it's like, it's light, but it's heavy. And what you do is you run and you throw this up as high as you can. So you're running as fast as you can. And you got this ball in your hand and you throw it up as high as you can. And then you do three, three, three flips. And then you land your landing and then you stick your right hand out and then you catch the friggin' ball. Like that is possible. That's what human beings are capable of doing. And if we do that on this physical level, we can do it on a spiritual, emotional, psychological, what have you. And that's where we're finding ourselves. And that is the energy which is necessary to really step into what we are finding in front of us, no matter where you are or what you're doing. Like that's, you know, that's where each person is finding themselves. 
And part of what I'm hoping to do is, is inspire people to look at their own lives, what they're finding in their day-to-day -day life. Like that is the gold. And everything that they've done has prepared themselves for this moment. And this is true for all of us. It is an even playing field. I mean, that was said by Madonna, Queen Esther, okay? This was said by her um, a couple days ago. It was, this is an evening, this is evening, 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 evening the playing field. And so apply that as truth because that's what it is across all barriers. Like everything which culture has taught you, for what is of value and what is not of value, particularly if you have found yourself being raised in a very, very modern materialistic culture, you're going to come face to face with like a whole bunch of stuff right now. But what we're doing and what we're seeing is like everyone is finding something quite, quite difficult with this, regardless of the degree of preparation. This is, this, is, this is going to challenge each person internally and externally, and they are completely connected. And at the same time, they're constantly being influenced. They're constantly being influenced by forces that you're unaware of. That is the truth of the human experience. And so that's a lot of what the, the Susquehanna alchemy storytelling is. I mean, I look at them primarily as timelines, timelines that have been anchored into physical reality. That's kind of a difficult concept to rationally wrap, wrap your mind around. So you don't want to really think too much of it. You can almost think of it like a cone. Like, you know, you just kind of sit with it without, without, trying to tell the story. And when you do that, when you know that like, this is what I'm sitting with, but I'm not trying to think it through. I'm not riddling with it. I'm just holding it. Like there's an alignment that comes with it. So, so that's kind of um, what the purpose of these stories are. I'm pointing out um, what is being told to us through the media whatever the media may be. And so I put these out the other day on um, Instagram. And so uh, the first one says, um, and the Instagram account is Susquehanna Alchemy. Definitely go check it out. Um, in the days following September 11th, 2001. And so what I got to keep in mind is I was 30 years old um, at um, on September 11th. That's a really interesting place to be. Like, I would say like anyone who was 30 years old, like we were like, quote unquote, in the sweet spot. Um, we were old enough to be mature and to be some degree of self-sustained, but at the same time, uh, we did not have the same degree of responsibility you would have when you're 40. And so that was a really good time to culturally receive the, the, um, impacts of the events of September 11th, 2001. And so my memory of it is going to be um, probably different than other people, depending upon their age and their, and their circumstances. And I remember very clearly of how the story was told to the public. And so that's clear in my mind. And I don't know if that's clear in so many people's mind, depending upon age and where they were at. Um, and so this only lasted for like, I don't know, like maybe six months, but in the days following September 11th, 2001, and there was this period very, very similar, echoing what is being experienced right now, but it happened quickly as opposed to like, you know, happening this, um, uh, this, this really deep, this really, really, um, slow, um, uh, uh, controlled, group psychological demolition. That's what we're witnessing. It was, it was more of like a sucker punch on September 11th, 2001. Though there was a bit of a wake up call with Y2K. Like people were like, kind of like, they're already like getting jittery, but 2001 was like the sucker punch. It was, it was, it was a cheap shot. 
And so for the six months, so a lot of us don't remember exactly what it was or what we remember was so tinted by being like punch drunk. Like you just got, you just like, if you've ever been like really clocked and not expected it, and then you can kind of remember like coming out of it and maybe you remember like, you know, there's going to be all sorts of, of, of psychological and emotional sort of feelings about being clocked. And so when you try to remember specifically what happened in the moments afterwards, it is not possible. That's just the nature of how we're designed. And so that's what happened in 9-11. So most people don't recall like what was happening or they recall one particular piece. And that's a hard thing to really capture from like an article or from a Wikipedia type of, of entry. But that being said, you know, this is how I remember it. And I'd be curious if other people remember this uh, in the same way. Um, but Donald Rumsfeld for like the six months following the events of 9-11 was really portrayed in the media as this like father figure of um, like you can count on him. Like this guy is, he's tough. He's telling you like it is, but there's something kind of charming and likable about him. And you're like, this guy knows what he's doing. And at the same time, the president was President Bush, the, 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 the younger President Bush, 43. And he was portrayed as like, at the very best, like he was, he was a very complex character in which how he was portrayed. But it was this mixture of like of the people who did who were repulsed, who were pushed back by his energy. They saw him as an absolute bumbling idiot, and those who were who were who were compelled by it, who were pulled into it, saw him as this like no nonsense. Like uh, he's not a, he's not eloquent. But he tells you how it is, you know, and there's a trustworthiness of it, a truthworthiness, and you know, watch the the Will Ferrell um, impersonations of 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 uh, of Bush because he captures the essence of how he is like, of how he's like. There's something likable about him in his like. Anyway, so. Rumsfeld was the mature father behind the, 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 the bush. And that was like the story, that was the soothing comfort that was given to the collective at the time of, um, right after 9-11. And so uh, that's what we see in this video. So it says, in the days following September 11th, 2001, Donald Rumsfeld established himself as a no-nonsense straight shooter and the voice of reason compared to my pet goat reading President Bush and the main street media loved him. They ate it up. And so like there was this, you know, it says right here, I'm just doing like uh, snapshots from, 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 from YouTube. All right. And this, this one here on the day of 9-11, this is George Bush and the snapshot, whether it's actually him or it was just like done as a, as like, you know, a psyop, but it shows him with the upside down book, My Pet Goats. And the children may or may not have been chanting like, you know, planes hit steel. Like, you know, this is what's put out on YouTube. And if you're looking at it, you're like, okay, this makes sense and this makes sense. And it's this like, it's a collapse wave. Um, and as he collapsed down in the, in the dates following was, was Rumsfeld. And then following, following the, the, the honeymoon phase of 9-11 and when people began to wake up to the fact that, that they had been sold a bill of goods, and this might have been like five, six years later, like, I mean, it was a while before like on a uh, noticeable level did people begin to wake up to the fact of, um, of that there was something else to the story. And so this is a reminder of what is inside the collective consciousness of what was imprinted on the days of 9-11. And I brought it up in another, in another um, uh, post about the similarities with 19, you know, 9-11, 19, COVID-19, the 19 hijackers. That phrase was used very, very heavily in the days after 9-11. And that's, it was like always said, the 19 hijackers, the 19 hijackers. So 19 is being linked. This is known in, in, in hypnosis as an anchor. You know, this is part of the anchor, you know, regardless of what 19 represents. 19 can represent a lot of different things, and it certainly has a significance within the Koran. 
And usually if there's a significance within one of the, the, the holy books, there's a significance within the other ones because there is a ripple effect. Um, regardless of what that is, you know, there's this 19 and it's there. And this is a reminder of what we saw um, back in the days of 9-11. And so here's the second slide. Um, so in the latest reboot, so this is a very much like looking at, um, looking at reality from a perspective of narrative regardless of, you know, without getting too much into like, well, where's the narrative coming from? And what is this? It's just like, this is a narrative. This is really out there. And this is really what's being put into the minds for whatever reason, because we don't understand reality. If anyone tells you this is what reality is, you run. It's like, this is what you are discovering. You know, you're like, okay, you know, what can I trust? What do I not? How do I become the gymnast who runs and does three flips and catches the, the, um, catches the ball? Like that is the symbol. Like that's what we're, we're figuring out. Like, how do you do that? That's a, that's, it's an art and it's a science. And so by looking at our outer world helps us understand the inner world and then also have more control with how the two meet. <laughs> that's called navigating of life. So, all right. So we've got, so let me, let me, uh, let me read this. So in the latest reboot, the Rumsfeld character is updated as doctor. And I don't even know how to pronounce his name, you know, um, uh, Falky, uh, doctor, right? You know, it's like, I listen, I listen to a lot of people, uh, analyze events and, and it's fun because when I hear them say something incorrectly, I'm thinking in my mind, it's like, this is how it's said. And so now I'm finding myself in that position. I'm like, I don't know how to say that word. I've never actually heard it said out loud, but anyway, so the Rumsfeld character is being updated. It's like, you recognize it by where they're similar. And it's like, yes, you can see how they're different by where they're different. And so it's like recognizing that outline is how you begin to sharpen the knife. And for just the purpose of sharpening the knife. So the latest Rumsfeld character is updated as this Dr. Fauci, Fauci, the sensible father figure who, who offsets the in over his head idiotic sitting chief. And I'm... I'm pointing this out because someone brought up as a comment that, uh, you know, I am, I am, uh, um, I am, I am casting judgment upon the, the character, <laughs> uh, as our, our sitting chief. Um, and <sighs> that's a complex situation and particularly this one. And so, that entire topic I can't even touch right now, but this, this analysis is from the perspective of, of looking at primarily of this as some sort of significant narrative in the collective of our experience. That's the only thing we can say for certain right now. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities, which it can be, but let's, let's, let's stay on this side of the edge. And so part of that is, is like learning to get this resolution is like, playing with the, with the nebulous and the, um, and the, uh, uh, the, the structured. And so that's learning how to go and do those flips and knowing where you're going to stand and catch that ball and being able to, to hold those experiences. So we got Bush right here. I mean, this guy looks almost like, you know, you can see this is Rumsfeld and there's a similarity just in terms of, of like, of, of like the glasses and the hair length. And in this picture, particularly like, you know, the, the outfit and the, the, um, the ethos, but this is also like a George Bush feel. And so we got George Bush right here. Um, and there's a quality associated with that as well, physically. Um, and so I, I, I put probably my personal favorite of the, of the George Bush quotes, which are out there is, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. You can't get, you can't get fooled again. <laughs> and so like, you know, this is a YouTube clip. I mean, the reality is all of this stuff could be staged or it could be CGI, you know, you don't see it by, with your own two eyes. And then like, there's always a possibility you didn't even see it. You know, it's, 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 
there's a little bit of a risk, whatever you believe, but you know, there is a truth in the fact is this stuff is out there. And so because of that, like I know there is a truth to it on that level. And so this is out there and we could begin to see that there is a similarity in terms of this story and the other story. And we can recognize by looking back at like really ourselves, <clears throat> our own lives and how much we've changed regardless of our age from 19 years ago. Um, and what is the last 19 years been about is, is, you know, that's what you get to work with. Um, and that's going to show itself in your real experience. Like it's, it's all blending in right now. And so when I tell this story, like when I'm pointing out reality as a storyline, it is as true in in, in, in understanding our own individual storylines. It's like, you know, there's a certain level of reality and it's, it's, it's kind of real, but it's not real. Um, where, where, uh, um, those two meet and that's your inner world and the outer world. And, and as you begin to have more and more control over that, um, as you begin to have more and more control over that, you're able to interact in a different degree of resolution. And that's why I like to use sports as a metaphor because it's like, you know, uh, athleticism, um, particularly in timing, you know, is, is, is in my opinion, the highest expression of, um, of, of the, the human, uh, physical expression. And then when you add in like the emotionality of, of like, you know, witnessing that, you know, it, it, it takes something spectacular, it, it becomes something spectacular, but though that's a physical expression, it points to that there's a truth on a higher level. And so what I'm suggesting right now, just as, as all human beings have the, the same capability, um, they may have limitations, but you know, the, the, the will to try is the same for, um, for anyone who reaches like this world-class level. It's like, certainly these, these people are endowed with, with physical prowess, but there's also a determination and a, a, um, a trial, which is, um, or a commitment, excuse me, which is, 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 um, you know, it's, it's uncommon and it's respectful. It's not limited to just athleticism, but that's where we can see it. So the point of all this is like, if there's ever been a time, if there's ever been a time to um, really take the inner world seriously, like now is that time. But if there's ever been a time where you can't take it, uh, you know, get not, where you don't want to get lost in your own inner world, like now is that time. And so it's like every, the, the, the playing field is leveled, you know, literally, this is true for everyone, wherever they've, wherever they're meeting it and however they're, they're responding. And this is like, you know, this is a difference, you know, it is changing right now, the inner world where it meets the outer world. And this is not just like, this was six, six weeks ago. You know, when I, when, when, when you hear that there's an element, which is like, you know, it's, it's, it's how much of that is abstract, you know, but suddenly, 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 you know, as the saying goes, may you live in interesting times, no matter where you are, you are living in interesting times. That is the level playing field. Everyone is in that place right now. And so that is true on every level. That is true on the part of it, which is, which is um, being controlled by man. And we're going to start to see, um, we're going to start to see what are the outlines of the structure of reality. And it's going to beginning to become clear of the different, like the, the different structures are just different demarcations within reality. And so this is going to happen on the inner world and it's going to happen on the outer world. And never before have we all been kind of sharing the same outer world. Like this is, this is affecting everyone. 
um, this is a rare event that way. And so because of that, we know it's affecting the inner world as well. And so we can only begin by holding that. By holding that and I share I share these stories I share these stories right here as a pointing out like this is happening on the outer world and yeah that's real and it's not real and it's like you can come up with reasons on like oh well this is this is this is this or this is is that and all of that is is true um, well, part of it is true what's gonna happen is you're gonna begin to see outlines of of what is true and what's not true and this is part of this discovery which is happening. But what you're seeing on the outer world is linked at what is happening on the inner world. And they are linked right now. We're coming face to face with it. Um, and so, as it says, may you live in interesting times. Uh, <laughs> um, right now, uh, if, this is, I, if this is interesting uh, for you, like this is what... Um, a new world is being created and I want to get more into it. Now is not the time. Like, um, first is becoming a recognition of what is kind of happening and not happening. And it's going to stabilize and it's going to stabilize, you know, look at nine 11, you know, this is just going to be, um, uh, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. Um, in some ways more in your face, in some ways, like, not as bad, I suppose. I don't know. I mean, we're going to see. Um, you're going to watch what's unfolding. Um, pay attention to your life. Pay less and less attention to um, uh, what what you're hearing or seeing from the computer box. Like uh, what you're seeing may may be good stuff, but what you're seeing may not be bad. May be bad stuff. You know, and there's an inherent, there's inherent fog of war right now. Make no set, make no mistakes. What is experiencing right now is if you were to go and read the book, um, The Art of War, like that's being applied culturally right now, you know, um, the degree of confusion which is happening is unbelievable and so um you know that is happening uh and you have to take that in consideration so there has to be a balance between what is being said whether it's something you and here's the tricky part of what you want to believe because what you want to believe and what you know to believe um you know sometimes they overlap and sometimes they're they're they're, they're right and sometimes they're not sometimes they're wishful thinkings and those are the demarcations which I'm talking about, and each person is kind of experiencing that because we're seeing that happen in external reality and cultural reality of like, you know, where are these demarcations? Like, you know, I thought they were the same, but they're not exactly the same. And it's starting to become clear that's happening within, it's happening without. And so it's recognizing these points in an internal way and an external way. And, and <laughs> you know, um, So MK Ultra is we is weaponized is weaponized emotional alchemy. You could even call it spiritual alchemy. And what I mean by that is so MK Ultra no doubt is uh, if not the main <laughs> you know, one of the main, the, one of the main influences of how the culture has become an inverse culture. And so, when you're looking at MK Ultra, like you're looking at some really, really kind of unpleasant parts of the culture, which is so close to most people that that it's, it's um, you know, it's one thing to look at something which you're not part of, but you know, this is, this, this goes back to all of this stuff, which, which everyone's part of, who's grown up really, really since 1945. But like, you know, MK Ultra has played a big part of that. Um, and 
just because it's unpleasant doesn't mean there's certain truths. That's what an inversion is, is it's taking truths and it's inverting it. It's bringing about something that's going to bring about a destruction. Um, and in that destruction, like one solid thing is going to be identified. You know, that is the story of alchemy. And there is, a, there is an inherent truth to that in human experience. There is an inherent truth to that. And how you know that is being human. It doesn't matter what your human is. There comes a point that however and whatever you live your life in what, in what um, you know, whatever octave that what you've built your life on is going to come crashing down. And how you respond to it is like the human experience. And that can happen in so many different ways. And when it is done, when it is, it's all, if you don't die, you do it well. <laughs> um, there are better expressions, but just like, you know, there is something, there is something, um, you know, you take your hats off to anyone who's been human because being human has, is a difficult experience. And really since 1945, it has been unlike anything that, has been since we've been told what life was like before 1945. We don't even know what this is. All we got is this 1945, since World War II. Um, and it's been so orchestrated to become a certain way culture has. We're more than culture, but culture affects our experience. And, and MK Ultra is a big part of it. And it's created this, in every single way, this, this, hidden, uh, this hidden sort of inversion. But this inversion is based upon a truth. And that truth is that, you know, something happens in life, or at least since 1945, where like an individual's life is going to collapse. And they're going to go through it. And it's going to be, it's going to be an inner experience, or it's going to be an outer experience. It's going to be a combination of the two. Like when it's purely inner, like some people aren't even going to recognize that at all. And then if it's outer, it's going to be like unbelievably, um, unbelievably recognized. You know, that's the sort of stuff you see in, in, in astrology. Like, you know, is it an emotional uh, like challenge or is it like, you know, a, a earthy, a physical challenge? You know, they can give hints at least. So, um, you know, that's the truth. And, and that's the reason why the inversion rituals, why they need so much ritual is because it's like, you know, it's kind of like manipulation of a truth and they got to get it done right. But when you do it right on like a higher level, it's like you're just being and what you're being is just in the natural harmony, which acts, you know, that's what the phi ratio is. The phi ratio just happens. So like when you are like in the phi ratio, you are just kind of like unfolding in a certain way which is the phi ratio is about growth. And that is the human expression. You know, we're five, we're a five, uh, we're the five fingered uh, family or the humans. And it's like, you know, that's total fractal sort of stuff. We got a torso and we got five things coming off of it. Then we got a hand and we got five things coming off of it. We got a foot, five things coming off of it. Got a head, five things, you know, we're fractal um, with five, which is phi, you know, and it's, it's, the pentagram and Venus, you know, that's five. So it just is, you know. Um, and so part of what, what has happened is like, you know, there's been an inversion part, which has been like all of this hidden stuff, you know, which is part of being human that we can't see has been just like needling at us. And it's been done some of it consciously. And some of it is just like, you know, we are tied into stuff, which is always done. And so like, this is part of like this self-awareness is recognizing like, you know, what is true and what is like, you know, uh, expression based upon, you know, what my life was and like this other people like purposefully, whether, you know, done, you know, from an individual level or like just a cultural level of, of my inner world was being affected in ways that I have no conscious awareness, you know, we're becoming aware of that and we're beginning to see like our inner world and our outer world are connected and we're beginning to see like everything which is happening in the outer world, like this collapses is brought down. Um, there's a truth to it and there's like something which isn't a truth, but there's, um, so all of this, like what's going to happen is we're going to come to a place where you're going to recognize, like, you know, um, you're going to have a clarity of your own inner world and your outer world, and you're going to see how they meet. And you're going to start to see how they're meeting in a very, very 
strange and bizarre way. That's what these, that's what these slides are about. This strange and bizarre way, how like this stuff is relating. Um, and we can add structure to it, but like there's, we don't want to do too much structure. It's like, as soon as you see the structure, you're like, oh, well, there's no structure there. But then you go deeper and the structure is even stronger, but it's on a different level. Like that's how reality is working. And that's like, you know, it's like looking at a magic eye picture. It's like, what you want to do is to see the 3D image. To see the 3D image is you have to find that balance. And as soon as you find that balance of that 3D image, if you were then to go and then put all of your awareness right back to the small detail of what's making up that 3D image, you can do that once you are able to hold the, the magic eye 3D images like with, with the degree of skill, you can then go and focus all your attention on that small detail. And like, if you do that, you're going to lose the 3D image. You're going to like drop it. Like, ah, oh, it's focused too much on the detail. That's what happens when we focus on too much of the detail. But what really gets good, and this is what, this is the nature of reality. If you are really good at holding that 3D image, if you can look at a stereogram and really hold that 3D image, and you got that, and you know like what it feels like in your physical body, like there's a physical feeling, like in your eyes and there's like a non-physical part of it but there's a physical part too um and if if you if you're unable to see it it's because one of those things is out of balance with the other and then when you begin to find it you realize like it's a dynamic it's not like solid there's a dynamic to it and then as you become more and more in harmony with that dynamic you then find the structure like that is kind of like you know that's the dance which we're learning when everything is like you're like there's a structure to it but there's a dynamic and the more i focus on the dynamic i lose the structure and the more i focus on the structure i can't find the dynamic and then what happens with the 3d picture you know to see the picture that's why 3d art is so important is there's a real ortho there's a there's a feedback mechanism and so when you see that feedback mechanism in 3D art and you hold it, and you're like, okay, I've demonstrated the skill. I can almost run and do three jumps and catch it, catch the ball. It's all the same thing. You know, I can finally like, I can finally like uh, levitate or whatever it would be. It's like breaking down reality based upon what's in our own backyard. And so with the 3D magic art, you begin to see those images. You're able to go and constantly understand Constantly understand. <laughs> Constantly understand how to hold the image. And once you hold the image, then what you can do is you can focus on a detail. Now, first you're going to lose the image. Like, okay, I lost it, I lost it. But then you can focus on the small detail. And what happens is you're able to find the 3D image, almost like a different 3D image within that small detail. And so what that is, is it's this recognition of being able to go into that space. It's like, okay, I found it, I found it, I can find structure, but then I got to release. It's like, where's the structure? Where's the structure? And now I release. You know, this is Qigong. This is yoga. This is like, you know, and we're all meeting this on different levels. Like if we're really good at it physically, you know, that may support us as we're developing the emotional or the spiritual or the psychological or it's going to help us expand that or you know it's also a reflection of how flexible we are potentially good at psychologically emotionally spiritually imaginatively you know they're all connected in one way and as we integrate more and more as we sync up as we line up then on one level and we're aware that they're connected then like this like thing happens where it all lines up right or at least that's the, that is the purpose of the practice is like, I'm learning how to find structure and letting go. I'm learning to find structure and letting go. And every practice is about that. It doesn't matter what the practice is. When you bring the resolution of finding structure and letting go in whatever you do, you're doing the practice. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's convoluted or not. It doesn't matter if you're doing it because so you're dancing to the flames in, in, in Plato's cave, or you recognize that, hey, I was dancing to the flames in Plato's cave. You know, that's like, you know, the Russian dolls. You keep on like, oh yeah, I recognize that. Oh, there's this other layer. Um, you know, we're all finding ourselves in that place. 
Um, this isn't quite explaining what that place is. It's recognizing how this place works. Um, you know, uh, this, is the this is the best analogy I always loved of life. It's like um, you can't control the cards that you are dealt. You can only control how you play them. <laughs> Love that. Um, this is Mike, and uh, I hope you got something out of this. Until next time.